We start this Tuesday at 4 o'clock with the story coming out of Wheat Ridge. It might be two more weeks before RTD can get the light rail station at the Jeffco government station back open to trains. This following the Saturday W line train derailment. And it could be much longer before we learn exactly what caused that train to blow through the end of the line and roll up a hill. Two people had minor injuries. Nine News reporter Steve Steger looked into this for us today. And Steve, RTD has technology that, that slows the train down, but not in this spot. Yeah, each light rail car has what is called ATS, automatic train stop. So anytime a light rail train approaches a red signal, the train will sound an alarm, then automatically start to slow down if the operator hasn't done so already. The problem is RTD doesn't use that technology at the end of it, any of its lines. W-line trains will not be servicing... Jeffs. Oh no, not another one. Uh, given that, you know, this is the third light rail um, incident in four years. When Richard Bamber saw the aftermath of a W-line train that blew through the end of the line in Golden this weekend, he thought what we all were thinking. It's pretty obvious that the train should have stopped. Difference okay. is, Bamber is a civil engineer who works with trains. He also founded Greater Denver Transit, a grassroots group pushing for a more reliable system in the Denver area. His group is pushing for a transparent investigation into what happened, a tough process in past light rail crashes. Information is withheld for an unnecessarily long amount of time. We want to know the root cause of that derailment so we can make sure that it doesn't happen again. RTD can't say much about what happened or allow us to see any records. State law requires them to keep things secret and report to the Public Utilities Commission. All findings will be returned uh, will be turned over to the PUC and then it will be their call as to what will be released. One of Richard's main questions is why technology didn't prevent this train from flying past a bump stop at the end of the track. Basically putting systems in that if the train train is detected to be not slowing down in enough time, you know, the system cuts in, sounds a warning and applies the brakes to the train automatically. RTD's light rail trains use a system called ATS, Automatic Train Stop. Basically, it's a signal light, and when the light is red, the train will automatically stop if it hasn't stopped already. But the agency confirmed today that system only prevents trains from getting too close to other trains. It doesn't necessarily slow down or stop light rail at stations or the end of the line. Bamber says that ought to be considered. It's on dedicated right away. It's you haven't got sort of vehicle traffic sharing. It's not on the streets. It's in a dedicated station. Um, and you know, reaching speeds of up to 55 miles an hour, um, it is appropriate to look at enforcing trains to stop at the end of the line. So after two derailments along the R line in Aurora, RTD told the Public Utilities Commission that they plan to add an automatic train stop signal to slow down light rail trains making that curve at Sable and Exposition. They'll do that by the end of this summer. RTD's commuter lines think the A, B and G end lines they all have what's called positive train control. It's a different system. That system will automatically stop trains at potential hazards like, say, the end of a line. Now, I haven't played with trains in years, <laughs> but it seems to me that a red light at the end of the line would be a pretty simple fix. It's going to be interesting to see what caused this crash. Like if this was operator error and something ended up kind of making that train just blow and kind of go through that station mm -hmm. and just blow by that bump stop, then this is a spot where maybe adding a signal there could allow the train to slow down if the operator isn't paying attention or the operator doesn't have the ability to slow down, that the signal itself would slow the train down. That's what they're going to look at as part of this investigation. Hopefully that investigation becomes public because of this law that keeps things confidential. Well, light hopefully rail. it moves along pretty quickly, too. It's yeah. not one of those things you want, okay, it'll, we'll know in five years. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah light okay. rail is one thing. Trains have been in the news lately, and yeah, it hasn't been good. Not we'll good. We'll see what happens The good here. news here is RTD operates something like 300 light rail trips a day. This has only happened three times in the last four years. It's still a lot, something that's worth looking into, but still pretty relatively safe. Yeah, to still three too many. All right. Thank you, Steve. Nearly two years ago, 10 people were killed inside the King Supers at, in Boulder. The prosecution for the suspect in that case, that's been on hold since he was found mentally incompetent to stand trial. Though a family member of one victim is now searching for justice somewhere else from the manufacturer of the gun that the suspect used in the shooting. 
the son of Suzanne Fountain filing a lawsuit yesterday claiming that Ruger used deceptive marketing practices when it comes to the gun, their AR-556. That gun, seen here, is legally classified as a pistol. The lawsuit, though, claims they created it with just enough changes to evade regulations that rifles fall under. The suit was filed in Connecticut, where Ruger is based. And one of the attorneys working on the case in Colorado says he feels the evidence will show that Ruger is glorifying the lone gunman. I've got no problem with the Second Amendment. But when you're using it, when you're twisting it to get something out here to the wrong people that go out and cause all of these deaths, something needs to change. Families of the Sandy Hook school shooting victims settled a similar lawsuit last year for $73 million. That suit was against the gun manufacturer Remington. They used that same Connecticut consumer law that this lawsuit is claiming that Ruger violated. Take a look outside of what's turned into a beautiful afternoon here in mid-March in downtown Denver. We're enjoying that. Yeah, and tomorrow sounds even better. Well, I'm all I for mean, that. I'm all about tomorrow, but Tuesday was pretty fabulous. More importantly, Kathy, we broke the Wednesday streak in a big way, it's sounding like. And that's so important, right? Because March is our snowiest month. How's it treating you so far, you guys? So far, so good. Right? Yeah, so I know I had one of the producers come back and say, what's going on? March is supposed to be our snowiest month. This is fabulous. I said, shh. Couple of weeks Don't to go. Because anything. you guys, we know we've had blizzards in April that can catch us up in a big hurry if we miss out on March, right? We had one on and this some, date two years ago. It, like yeah. we don't know, right? No. Crazy. Yeah. I know. So here we are with mid 60s, beautiful weather, and we could see 70 tomorrow. Now, when that happens, you know a storm can't be far behind, and that's exactly what's happening. But we haven't seen 70 degrees in months. So we'll enjoy this beautiful day with a thin veil of high clouds moving over downtown Denver. We'll see the snow start to redevelop in the high country and western slope areas overnight and into tomorrow, but we're dry and warm along the front range. 62 in Denver this hour, almost 70 in Pueblo, Lamar, 43 in Steamboat, 57 in Grand Junction. Wind hasn't been a big factor for us, thank goodness, because that can create some travel issues as we know. We're seeing the high and mid layer clouds coming in and ahead of yet another California storm system. System. They're bracing for more rain. They already have evacuations out in and around portions of Southern California. Flood watch out Monterey, California. The Sierras are bracing for more snow. That's the system headed for Colorado in the next 48 hours. Winter weather and travel advisories have already gone out. These will go into effect late tonight through Thursday. We have a few clouds tonight. We have a beautiful day tomorrow. No real big issues. We start to see some changes late tomorrow night, and it will be in the form of rain initially, but let's talk about this night because you need to get outdoors if you can get that glorious sunshine. It feels so good. 60s in the city now dropping into the mid 50s around dinner time in Maine weather. Yeah, close to 70 degrees tomorrow. Thursday's the change cold rain and snow, and then we're going to look ahead to St. Patrick's Day on Friday, the weekend and Tom, the vernal equinox. The start of spring is next Monday. That's always exciting, Looking isn't it? Though? That. Yeah, all oh, sorts of stuff's happening, especially right after now. this winter. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Kathy. We'll see you in a few minutes. Well, Starbucks was back in court today appealing a ruling last month that found the chain guilty of unfair labor practices at four stores in Colorado, two of them in Denver, two more in Colorado Springs. Those stores, the workers filing complaints with the National Labor Relations Board over the last year, alleging retaliation, intimidation, wrongful termination and more. That in response to the efforts of those workers to unionize. Last month, an administrative law judge sided with those workers ordering the wrongfully terminated employee be reinstated, among other remedies. Starbucks disputed the ruling and appealed, but our 9 News legal analyst Whitney Trailer says the employee's rights laws will likely cause the appeal to be struck down, and that might establish a precedent going forward. And what that means going forward then is certainly at Starbucks and other um, industries and stores companies across the country it just makes it um, it creates more precedent making it easier for folks to unionize but I'll say these are laws that have been on the books for years and years and years so it's not difficult to unionize now if the review does go in the way of the workers Whitney says it could serve as a cautionary tale for employers in what is currently an employee friendly labor environment 
An international incident in the skies. American officials saying today that two Russian fighter jets brought down an American drone over international waters near Ukraine. That drone over the waters of the Black Sea. One of those jets flew in front of the unmanned drone and then intentionally dumped fuel. Then one of the planes clipped the drone, damaging its propeller, forcing the U.S. to bring it down into the Black Sea. Aircraft from both countries have been operating in the area throughout Russia's war with Ukraine. This, though, is the first known interaction of this kind, and it could be seen as a potentially dangerous escalation during a critical period of fighting. Fierce, funny, a proud feminist, Colorado's first congresswoman, Pat Schroeder, passed away last night. First woman in Congress from our state. She was elected in 1972, and at that time, she was just one of 16, 17 women serving in the House. A pilot, a Harvard-trained lawyer. She went on to be reelected 11 times from the 1st District, and over the 24 years that she represented the Denver metro area, many things changed, including family leave, and many people were changed by Pat Schroeder. She was a force in Colorado and American politics. Pat Schroeder was 82 years old. And when Congresswoman Schroeder decided not to run again in 1996, Diana DeGette won that seat and she continues to serve District 1. She's joining us now today. I know we've been talking about this. It's taken a little while to process this news. It was such a su surprise, Kim, I, because I was just in touch with Pat a few weeks ago and she was vibrant, she was engaged, she was had an opinion on everything, <laughs> yeah. as always. And so to hear this news was just shocking to everybody this morning. Yeah, when we talk about her and we talk about what a, a pioneer she was to talk about women's rights and family leave and the infamous one-liner, I have a uterus and I have a brain and I can use both. As a mom going into Congress, she really thought about women and how she could make a change. Well, when she was elected to Congress, she was only 32 years old and her kids were two and six. That's why someone said, do you think someone with young children can serve in Congress? And that's when she said, I have a uterus and a brain. <laughs> but she spent all of her whole career talking, uh, trying to fight for family rights, for women's reproductive rights. And yet she did it in a way that was classy mm -hmm. and with a wry wit that will never be matched. Yeah, she had some one-liners yeah. that will forever she's, be remembered. She's the one who coined the Teflon president about Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah, she, she wasn't afraid to put her opinion out there, but to back it with a lot of fact. Yeah, and she knew what she was doing. When you talk about the number of women in Congress at the time, now, compare it to now. So, so it was 17 when she came, and now, I think it's 98 Democratic women and even more who are Republicans too. So it's, it's, it's up to one third of Congress, I think, but half the Democratic caucus almost is female. And that's due to, to people like Pat Schroeder and the other few women that were there then. But she was the only one who came in with small kids. Yeah, when you talk about that, what's her legacy in your mind? Is it, you know, I know there were so many things when you put your name on things, all the years you've been in Congress, you have certain things that matter the most. Well, the Family and Medical Leave Act, all of the work she did for veterans, she was the first woman to serve on the Armed Services mm. Committee. But, but here at home, she and she told me this, her proudest accomplishment was decommissioning the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and turning it into a beautiful wildlife refuge. It was the most contaminated site in the United States from army munitions, and she was able to get it made into a beautiful, beautiful open wilderness area. Well, not a wilderness area, but an open space. space. And, and so she had a, so much legacy, but her biggest legacy of all was, was inspiring people like me to think big. I was in high school when Pat Schroeder was elected to Congress, and so I was able to think about oppor uh, uh, you know, opportunities for w young women like me and everybody. I only ever voted for two women, or two people for Congress, Pat Schroeder and myself. That idea of giving a hand up, she really got that. She understood the importance and significance. And I, I, for, for many of us, we remember when she toyed with that run for president. And a lot of people thought she could really do it. And then just, she said, 
forget it. I, I don't want to do this. I don't enjoy this fundraising aspect of it. But she was so emotional in her decision. And there were those that criticized her for that. And I think back now thinking, why wouldn't you be emotional in that decision? Well, I think she, I think she made it acceptable not just for women to be emotional at moments like that, but men yes. too. And, and we, we see this, John Boehner, for example, when he was Speaker mm -hmm. of the House, he used to cry frequently. I just saw him crying recently at the retirement, or the speakership retirement ceremony for Nancy Pelosi. So I think Pat made it acceptable to be a real person, and that's what Pat was. She was a genuine person. She was brilliant, she was smart, and she was very witty, but she was so real. So real. so real. I know we got an email today about her role in Children's Museum. So many things. That we could talk forever, but um, thank you for spending time to share some of your memories. It's an honor. I know. I know you said you just got a Valentine's Day card from yeah, her. Yes, she just sent me a Valentine a couple of weeks ago because she found out that I had a new grandbaby and she wanted to congratulate me and she wanted to invite me to come see her in Florida. So. I, I'm saving that Valentine. Well, I'm sorry for you too, because you were close. Uh, my yeah, she mentored me. She mentored me. Um, she used to contact me on a frequent basis when I was first elected because she knew how hard it was. My kids were two and six, just like hers were when she was elected. So she, she was right there for me all those years. Thank you, Congressman DeGette, for coming in. And, and to the family of Pat Schroeder, we're thinking about you. And just glad that she was able to share so much of her life with the people of Colorado and Amen. around the country. Thank Amen. you. Thank you.